But they go, therefore, what? Find a few people to do it? No, they go, therefore, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, unquestionable character, diligent, always on time. You, you get the idea, right? Full of the spirit and of wisdom. We're like, why? Are they going to preach next Sunday? No, because they, they, need to, they need to take care of tables. Do we live to work or do we work to live? I know it sounds like it's just like a play on words, but there's, a, there's actual difference there. Are we the kind of people, did God create us to have a life so that we could work? Or did God create us to, to work so that we can have a life? Does that make sense? And depending on your answer to this question is very telling of like, whether you lean Roman Catholic or Protestant, actually, and then whether you side with C.S. Lewis or Dorothy Sayers. That's the second matter, which I'll, I'll, I'll give you a quote of Sayers here. But what do you guys think? How many of you guys, just on the face, do you guys see the difference at least? You gotta notice the, note the difference. Are we created so that we can live in order to work? Or are we created to work so that we can have a life, right? On the face of it, just real quick, how many of you guys would lean A? Just kind of curious. How many of you guys would lean more B? Hmm. So, half the world are Protestants. Actually, this kind of maps onto the real. So, if you live in order to work, what's more important, your Sunday or your Monday through Saturday? Okay, Monday. Do you see that? If you're A, you're more about Monday through Saturday than you are about Sunday. In other words, Sunday is like a time for you to be energized to go and deploy your calling Monday through Saturday. If you're, B, so, and what is that, by the way, Protestant or Roman Catholic? It's why is it more Protestant? Because for Protestants, Sunday is a celebration, and it kicks off the rest of the week where you really worship God more with the, the six seventh of your life, so to speak. But if you're like, hey, I work so I can get through Monday through Friday, take a break on Saturday, and go to church on Sunday, because Sunday is where God is truly worshipped then what does that sound a little, I mean, these are big caricatures, I get it, but what does that sound more like? The Roman Catholic week culminates in the worship of God on Sunday. Mass is always more important than Monday, generally speaking. Are, are you following that? Again, these are very big generalizations. But so to answer your question, if you are A, you're a lot more Protestant, you believe in the huge importance of work as worship, but if you're B, like, I just, I'm trying, to sh I'm trying to make it to Friday so I can get over to Saturday so I can really get to Sunday, that's a Roman Catholic, let's really worship God on Sunday, right? So, right? Um, now, there, 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 there are uh, dangers of both, right? If you're Roman Catholic, the danger would be what? You so prize Sundays that what? Yeah, the weekday you don't do much for the Lord and ritual becomes m quite important. But the problem with Protestants is what? Monday through Friday we're all out for the Lord, but then Sunday we just skip church. <laughs> right? Like, that's not that important. <laughs> right? Whereas the Catholic, no, Sunday is really important, but it can get ritualized. On the other hand, ah, it's not important at all. I can do church with the internet. So here's Dorothy Sayers, right? She says, what is a Christian understanding of work? That work is not primarily a thing one does to live, but a thing one lives to do. It is, or at least it should be, the full expression of the worker's faculties, the medium in which uh, he offers himself to God, right? So that's a very Protestant view that, that our whole lives are worship, okay? Are friendships something that are to be enjoyed or used? Or is your bank account, assuming that let's say you're, you're now 45 years old and you have a lot of money there or something, it, or is your money to be meant something for you to be, to be enjoyed or to be used? You buy a brand new Tesla, should it be enjoyed or used for the kingdom? What about marriage? Is it wrong for us to say marriage? Like your spouse and you go to a Starbucks while you evangelize somebody and that your spouse is praying for you guys while, you know, while you're evangelizing, like a team ministry like that. Is that, is that what a marriage is for? 
or sh is a marriage something that's meant to be enjoyed, right? So friendships, marriage, cars, money, whatever, gifts from the Lord, are they to be used or enjoyed? Ellie? But can it be, can marriage be enjoyed? But it is enjoyed. Okay. It so it's both. It is both. So check this out, right? Here's why I bring this up, right? And the next quote you'll see is, some Christians tend to go like, um, we're supposed to just use the gifts of God as instruments. Instruments, right? And, um, and that view, if you take it too far, which uh, to be honest, I, I feel that in that case it might be, uh, but instrumentalism, as opposed to what Augustine said, right? He said, he said there are two ways to appreciate a gift. One is to use them, but also use and enjoyment go together, should go together in the kingdom. Now, if you go too far in enjoyment, like, okay, God, I don't want to be guilty of using my family for the kingdom, so I'm just going to enjoy my family. We're going to just have great Disneyland experiences for whatever. We're just going to enjoy everything, right? Um, and, uh, oh, God, you've given me a great bank account, I, I'm, and I worked hard, and thank you, Lord. I'm going to I'm going to enjoy all of this for our family and enjoy this because Park or Augustine or somebody said enjoyment is as important as use. The problem with that is, of course, hedonism, right? But if you strike a proper balance between these extremes, right, um, somewhere around here, you strike a proper balance, then actually you get closer to what Calvin says. He says this, Now if we ponder to what end God created food, most of us are like, oh yeah, just eat it so you can hurry up and do God's work. Uh, we shall find that he meant not only to provide for necessity, but also for delight and good cheer. Like, it's okay to enjoy, you know, what's that chicken place on the street that you guys all like? Canes. Yeah, canes or whatever, right? <laughs> okay. Um, and then he says this, does the purpose of clothing apart from necessity, again, old English speaking here, but comeliness or decency like it goes well, it co goes well with comeliness like it goes well with it's, it's becoming of you um, in grasses trees and fruit apart from their various uses there is beauty of appearance and pleasantness of odor like God didn't have to make flowers smell good <laughs> is basically what he's saying and he's he's referencing Genesis 2 9 which I'll, I'll show you on the next screen he says, if this were not true the prophet would not have reckoned them among the benefits of God that wine gladdens the heart of man, contract notwithstanding, um, <laughs> and oil makes his face shine. He's getting that from Psalm 104. So if you never noticed this in Genesis 2, it's kind of neat. It's a short little verse, but it kind of encapsulates with a lot of what Calvin said. The Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, right? Like God didn't have us plant things just to survive on earth. He wanted us to look at them and just be awed by the beauty of some plants, right? Or, 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 or roses or what have you. So here's another place where he says something similar. Has the Lord clothed the flowers of the great, with the great beauty that greets our eyes? And he, if you notice, even his language is kind of poetic. He's trying to embody what he's trying to say. The sweetness of smell that is wafted into our nostrils. And yet, will it be unlawful for our eyes to be affected by that beauty? Or our sense of smell by the sweetness of that odor? What? Did he not so distinguish colors as to make them more lovely than others? What? Uh, did he not endow gold and silver, ivory and marbles with a loveliness that renders them more precious than other metals or stones? Did he not render many things attractive to us apart from their necessary use? So long story short, right? Maybe it's not just like, hey, how much would that renovation cost for that chapel? And if it's more than, you know, $100,000, let's not do it because we need to give all the money to charity or missions or whatever. But it's, wait, maybe the Lord prizes beauty too. So, so, so font selection and guitar practice and vocal lessons are part of the kingdom work too. And, and then just fill in that from A to Z. Like, is that, I know I'm making a bit of a jump there. But all, um, so beauty matters to the Lord. So I guess the question uh, could be, and look, here's a quick, you know, um, picture of that, right? I mean, it was very finely detailed. Um, God appreciates beauty. And so let me just give you biblical grounding for that a little bit. You might have seen this again already in your reading, 
But um, check out Bezalel, right? Like after 30 chapters of like, here's how I want you to make it. Like it's just not 30 chapters, several chapters throughout the 20s. The Lord then says, so point, he's like, okay, let's get ready to set the chapel, tabernacle. And um, here's the first person I want you to, to think about. I, he says, I have set apart um, Bezalel and filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence. We're like, oh, wow, he's going to be our senior pastor, right? Like, he's anointed by the Spirit of God. He's got intelligence on him. But if you notice, the first person God picks out is not the senior pastor of the tabernacle. Rather, if you look, notice the rest of it in this um, passage, God has gifted him with knowledge and craftsmanship. Okay, so maybe it's not the senior pastor. For artistic design to work in gold, silver, bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood to work in every craft. So God is basically saying, Be beauty really matters to me, and I want this guy to really go all out in his video editing skills. I'm just trying to make the modern, I'm just contemporizing it, right? Or let me give you another example from the New Testament. In Acts 6, again, just to kind of note the reference, and I think you get the idea, but in Acts 6, the apostles say this. They, they began to complain that, you know, church life is getting busy. Um, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now, it sounds like the apostles are like, oh, we're so above cleaning tables or serving tables. So just find a few people to just take care of that for us because we're busy doing God's work. That's, what, that's, a, that's how a dualistic way of thinking is. That's how a non-calling, you know, a full orbed sense of calling is. But they go, therefore, what? Find a few people to do it? No, they go, therefore, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, unquestionable character, diligent, always on time. You, you get the idea, right? Full of the spirit and of wisdom. We're like, why? Are they going to preach next Sunday? No, because they, they, need to, they need to take care of tables, serve food well. Because that's of worship to God, too. Does that make sense? I mean, Acts 6 is amazing to me because it's like, no, not just preaching the Word of God is worship. It's diaconal duties, right? Like setting, handing out programs. But then it's also true about Monday through Saturday. Okay, that's the idea. Um, and then lastly, lastly on this is um, back to Acts 31, the same chapter, if you notice. Acts 31, there's an interesting verse, which you guys remember this, um, the, the Ten Commandments, right? Keep the Sabbath holy. You know this from Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. But a few chapters later, they restate the uh, commandment, but in uh, more, more by way of an encouragement and uh, a reminder in this way. So the Lord says here, It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made, the, made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day, he rested, right? We all know that, right? Six days creation, seventh day, he rested. Question, why did the Lord rest? For what reason? And then if you look at the rest of this verse, it's powerful. I don't know if you've ever caught this reading through Exodus 31. But he rested for what purpose? And was refreshed. Now, what's the point of the writer of the, of the book of Exodus? Not that God literally needed to take a break and catch his breath, because that was a big task, creating the world in seven, six days. Not that, but the point is more of a hyperbole. If God, who is infinite in power and actually doesn't need rest, rested and was refreshed, how much more do you and I, given that we're embodied creatures, need to go all in for God, but then go all in on your Sabbath too, right? Just a quick illustration of this. Um, I, uh, I think I, I shared with you guys that, you know, during my doctorate, I went all in. I tried to finish it in a pretty quick pace. But the reason why I think I finished it pretty early um, was not because I'm smarter than my colleagues. I'm absolutely not. Actually, I know probably most of them are, all of them are probably more brilliant than I am. But the reason why I finished my work in three uh, years and three months, give or take, versus the typical four years, is because of my Sabbath. I, except for two Sundays, I mean, at two weekends, to Saturday. I used to Sabbath on Saturday. It's, um, it's not because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist or a Jew, but it's because um, I believe in the principle of six and, one, six and one, not necessarily Sunday. So what I would do is I'd rest on Saturday, like full-on rest, and then on Sundays after church, what I would typically do, because I'm already in town, I would just go to my college library, and I would spend like 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. working, and those five hours, by the way, this is just kind of like a tip for you guys as you kind of structure out your week. My, my Sunday one 
to 6 p.m. was probably my most productive five hours in the week entirely because the way I approached it was if I, if I get these five hours like, like solid, then let's say Monday through Friday if I work my eight hours, but like an hour here or there on a given day I'm feeling sluggish or I don't, you know, I'm just like distracted a little bit or whatever, I already had made up for it, so to speak, or on, on the front end by putting in those five hours. And so, man, you couldn't, you couldn't stop me with anything during those five hours because I, I, just, I just went all in and did it. But come Saturday morning, or really kind of Friday night till Saturday night, 24 hours, oh man, I Sabbath like there was no tomorrow. Like I would, I don't care what it was, like I, I was just like YouTube for 15 hours or something, like just completely any other than work. But it made my Sunday, my half Sunday and Monday through Friday super productive. And I got fully refreshed. And corporate studies show this as you, as, you, as you Sabbath in a regular pattern. But biblical patterns show this, that as you Sabbath, the Lord can use you more, um, more, more, more effectively um, because you respect your embodiment, right? And so that's just one other lesson that we need to take from liturgy, embodiment, and so forth. I'll last thought on that. How do you take care of yourself? Well, I always tell everybody there's a balance and there's got to be ultimately a, a reason why you're doing things. For us, it's this calling for John, so we have the reason, and then you got to take care of yourself. Uh, so besides God, family first, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, luckily right now, it's, it's a great uh, ability to have my wife work side by side. Mm -hmm. My kid is older, so he's in college and doesn't need us as much. So, mm -hmm. But we take care of that first. So she, we can communicate, we do that. And, and on a personal level, I still work out three times a week, mm -hmm. go to the gym, mm -hmm. and it's the only time where I run twice a week, and then I surf a couple of times a week still. Mm -hmm. um, it's the only time where you clear your mind, and, but everybody should have that place where they can, um, it's not necessarily resting, mm -hmm. but it's just you. It's mm -hmm. you, and, and it's not by you and anybody else, or not even trying to communicate with God. It's just like clear your mm -hmm. mind for a few minutes. But uh, if anybody is a runner, they'll understand that, because when you're running, it's truly to me, it's not like, like surfing is different because I'm talking to people out in the water. Mm -hmm. And then when you're in the gym, people can, yeah. tend to talk to you and you're like, Ooh, I'm working out, I'm pretending <laughs> to work out. But when you're running, you have that headset. It's just you and, and your thoughts about getting to the next street or, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, and it's, I don't think about anything when I'm running. Mm -hmm. I honestly think of like, I don't even know if I'm hearing the music. I don't even know why I wear it. I yeah, have yeah. The earphones, but you just run and that helps me clear my mind up. And, Whenever I have a super, super bad day, I go to the track and run. Mm. I don't go home straight mm. because I figure it's not, it's not fair to the, my wife and kid or mm. my friends if I go have a bad day at work and now I've got to go home and take it out on the break. Yeah. Versus I, I go out to the track and I take it out on the track and I leave it at track because yeah. I'm usually dead tired yeah, yeah. when I leave the track. Yeah. So everybody needs to do that. It's not necessarily about rest, but it's having quiet moments to yourself. Mm. And I know a lot of people like to meditate. That's awesome. But for me, running is my meditation. Yeah. So. Speaking of that, one thing I, um, in the little I've interacted with you and Michelle, I kind of have noticed that you know, you've referred a lot of times for end of day is just you guys, you know, and I really appreciate that. Um, we really think that character is just as important as calling, if not more. Um, so do, would you have some pieces of advice for, you know, folks who are like, because nowadays it's like, you got to go 110%, forget everything else, it's all about you, you got to make it in life and so forth. And there's some good inspiration there, but sometimes it's at the expense of everything else. So that's really cool that you say, like, I'm going to go with a track. So, I don't know, are there pieces of advice that you would give to uh, um, young entrepreneurs or anybody who's just trying to make, make it um, to try to encourage them about, like, work-life balance and just and, and, how, and how character and, and being with your wife and all these things have kind of help shaped who, who you are and how you live your life? Well, if, if you're trying to be, if you're going to build a business or be an entrepreneur and it's all about finances, it's going to be short-lived. Mm -hmm. I mean, so what if you're the richest man in the world if you're alone? Mm -hmm. I mean, that to me is so silly. So the, that is, uh, and, and everybody gets a little bit of that when you first start your own company because the, the ultimate goal when I started well, was, it was, it was about surfing, then all of a sudden it took a weird turn and it was about financing. Mm -hmm. Because then you were, man, I should be, I want to drive a BMW, I want to sure, live sure. in my big house. Yeah, yeah. So it becomes about that. Because, and, and now I think this, you know, in, every generation had a little bit of selfishness that that's what you want to accomplish. You want to go back to, to your university and show the, all the professors that you've made. <laughs> so, but 
as I got older, the thing that I found is, is it, it can be very lonely at the top. Mm -hmm. And if you start being thinking that you're somebody, then it becomes even more lonelier because mm -hmm. then everybody's cutting to. So having true family and friends is, is just as important. If you don't have a purpose that is not just financial, mm -hmm. you're not going to be happy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, at the end of the day, if I didn't have somebody to share share what I accomplished with, it, it'd be meaningless. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, one, the, it's sort of in a weird way, like a lot of ways, is you know, being having my son being proud of who I am is now that mm -hmm. way more bigger award than I've ever gotten publicly. Like you know, been you know, been I've been awarded a lot of things, but having your own son goes to you, yeah, you're all right. Mm -hmm. You know, that mm -hmm. that's you know, that's even bigger. Yeah, so that's great. I did a movie called Hackers mm. in London, and um, I came in to replace uh, a producer and had a good time. But I also, you know, with my kids and family, made a, you know, uh, an arrangement with them that I would, um, you know, bring them over with me and try to take care of them because my kids were 16 and mm. and 10. Mm -hmm. So um, I try to bring my kids with me. You know, when I can, to help experience other cultures and, 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 and the travel as well as just time together. And I took the job and in New York with my kids. Uh, my wife was in LA, and it turns out that her father committed suicide. Mm. And it was shocking. Mm. Uh, 80 years old, hanging himself. Mm. I mean, brutal. Um, and, sh and shocking because, you know, we didn't have any sort of notice of it. it, it you know, why would he do that? It, you know, all that yeah. stuff of suicide that's horrible. Um, and I was stuck in terms of whether I continue on. I was leaving the next day for London, and the kids were going home. Uh, and it was really hard. And I made the wrong choice. Hmm. I went to London to keep working on the movie. I have a very intense committed group of uh, uh, community around that helped out with my wife. But I didn't really understand the depth of what was going on, yeah. despite the fact that I had pastors and mm. Bible study friends and close long time. It, it didn't matter. I didn't realize. Mm. And so I did a good job, and we, we muddled through all of that um, for a month or two, and then I got an offer. I got a call from, from uh, the head of the studio at that time, MGM, who said, you know, we're having, we want you to leave this picture. I was like, what? Hmm. Well, because we want you to go on to a Bond movie, we've got trouble with the James Bond movie, hmm. and you should, you should come over and do that for us. Hmm. So the ambition part of me was, you know, sure. uh, I've, done, I've done Star Trek, now I've done this, now I can do James Bond, you know, um, you know, there's a, like, a tank chase in Moscow for a month, you know, which on your resume would look hmm. pretty fantastic. Mm -hmm. But I at least had that sort of moral voice inside my wife, you know, saying, you know, you better talk to your wife. So let me <laughs> just check in with the boss and let me yeah. find, you know. And, you know, we had a very hard, rough conversation. And I chose not to take that movie. Mm. And the MGM head, uh, never talk to me again because I turned him down. He said, oh, you're, it, oh, the job's too hard. And I go, no, I didn't say the job's too hard. What I said was, I'm choosing my family. I can't be away that long. And so I ended up at home for six months without a job hmm. um, and feeling like I'm doing the right thing. God, you know, you told me that yeah. I should stay home. And I committed to my wife that I would not leave town until the kids got out of high school. Hmm. So how do I, f I'm, I'm looking for significance. My wife's looking for all the jobs that shoot in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems like an impasse that's never gonna happen. And I don't, you know, I don't think God answers every prayer this way, but for me, um, I got a, an offer to work with Steven Spielberg out here in Woodland Hills hmm. uh, for two years. And so, you know, out of sort of that making the right choice mm -hmm. comes an answer that I was 
okay with in terms of it wasn't features, but it was television and it was close to home and it was, oh, by the way, you get to interact with Steven Spielberg every day. That's great. So, I, but I had no visibility of that sure. in making the choice. Right. I, I had no idea yeah. that was the kind of thing that would happen. Um, so, and you know, there's been plenty of other things where the answer is not what you like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, you gotta, you gotta trust, you gotta hang on. Yeah.